A solid gospel presentation can actually be made in around five minutes, but because I'm aware of the minutia of detail that people can argue about, we're going to take the long way around on this one. And we're going to start our investigation by remembering that the moral law comes from God. It is eternal, perfect and true, and we can represent that, as usual, with a long, solid, straight line. Because the moral law comes from God, it is eternal and unchanging, hence the two arrows on the end. In fact, we could call it God's law. He underpins it and defines it. Now, in the previous section, we learned that the moral law tends to underpin the civil law of a nation. So because I live in Great Britain, I am currently subject to the civil laws of Great Britain. And the civil laws of Great Britain are generally speaking underpinned by the moral law. So because God's moral law has always said that murder is wrong, the British civil law that sits on top of it states that murder here is illegal. The moral law has always said that stealing is wrong, so therefore the British civil law that sits on top of it states that theft here is illegal. Now, if Great Britain as a political entity suddenly ceased to exist, the civil laws that govern this island would also cease to exist. But would that suddenly make murder on this island morally acceptable? Of course not, because as our chart shows, even though the civil law of Great Britain disappears, the moral law that underpinned it would remain. There would no longer be a British police force or judiciary system to prosecute me and put me in jail, but I would still ultimately be responsible to God, and it would still be morally wrong to murder. Murder was morally wrong before the British government existed, and it will be morally wrong even if it stops existing. You see, the civil laws of a nation are temporary, come and go, can be changed and die when the nation does, but the moral law in which they are founded are as eternal and unchanging as God himself. So here's a key point. What's happening on top of the moral law is variable, but the moral law itself is eternal and constant. Now, throughout the history of the world, there have been various dispensations or economies of time where God himself has instructed and guided his people with laws that sat on top of his moral law in the same way that the British civil law does. For example, in the Garden of Eden, God instructed Adam and Eve to keep the garden and to eat from certain trees, but not from another. This set of instructions constitutes a kind of civil law that we could call the Law of Eden. The Law of Eden didn't contradict the moral law in any way. In fact, it was an expression of and gave insight into the underlying moral law, which in turn gives insight into God's character. As we know, Adam and Eve broke the Law of Eden by eating of the forbidden fruit and that dispensation of time ended. Man was no longer allowed to eat freely from the garden and he was instead told he would have to toil and work for his food. Woman was told that she would now labour in childbirth. The world entered a new post-Eden era. As this new time period came into play, it brought with it another law. The law of this time is known as the Law of the Patriarchs because it was known to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who are the patriarchs of the Judeo-Christian faith. Again, this law was an expression of the moral law which underpinned it. Not much is known about this law, but some of the instructions were not to eat blood, not to commit murder, not to allow a murderer to live, and to be fruitful and multiply. A history of this period shows that there were other laws of which mankind was aware. After the fall of Adam and Eve in Eden, God was looking to create a righteous nation through whom he could execute a plan of redemption for the world, a plan that would culminate in Jesus Christ. As he was looking around for a man to become the patriarch of this new nation, his eye settled on Abraham. God came to Abraham and made an eternal covenant with him. A covenant is basically a binding oath or promise, a bit like marriage vows where people promise to love one another eternally and unconditionally. Now this covenant had three parts. 1. God promised to give Abraham and his descendants a land that would be theirs for all time. Number 2. God promised that those same descendants would become a great nation made up of a multitude of people as numerous as the stars. Number three, God promised that this nation would be blessed and that they would be a blessing to the world. He went further and said that anyone who blessed Abraham's offspring would be blessed themselves and anyone who cursed them would be cursed. Abraham's son was called Isaac and his son was called Jacob. Jacob was renamed Israel and this group of Abraham's descendants thenceforth became known by that name. The nation of Israel was born. Now because of the eternal nature of this covenant, the three promises within it still stand to this day. That means that the land of Israel belongs to the Israeli people today and it will do for all time. It means that the people of Israel will always exist, despite the best attempts of hostile neighbours and dictators to exterminate them. 
It also means that people who bless Israel will be blessed and people who curse Israel will be cursed even today. Anti-Semites be warned, God is faithful to his promises. I will include a few examples of what God does to nations who come against Israel in an appendix to this series. But before we get off track with that, the main point I want to make here is that God made this covenant with Abraham in the first place because he had been so obedient to God's laws. God said, I will do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed all my requirements, commands, regulations and laws. Now, after Abraham, Isaac and Jacob came his son, Joseph. Everyone knows the story of how Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers and how he ended up in Egypt. There he rose to become the country's prime minister and it was during those years in Egypt that Israel really began multiplying. After many generations, they had multiplied so much that Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, began to feel threatened by them and tried to enslave them. That's when God famously called Moses to lead them out of Egypt and into the land that God had promised them all those years ago through his covenant with Abraham. As they were on their way out of Egypt and heading towards the promised land through the Sinai desert, God decided to give them a new written law that would govern their lives as a new nation in this land. Moses wrote these laws down and therefore it is known as the Law of Moses or the Mosaic Law. A new dispensation of time was in effect. Now the most famous part of the Law of Moses is the Ten Commandments which were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Pretty much everyone knows about them, even if just through the Cecil B. DeMille movie starring Charlton Heston, and they helped to form the moral heart of the law. But the whole law was actually far more extensive than just Ten Commandments. There were actually 613 rules altogether. 365 of them were negative, in other words, thou shalt not, and 248 of them were positive, in other words, thou shalt. Within these 613 rules, some were moral, some were ceremonial, and some were social. In other words, this law was to govern every single aspect of life in the brand new nation of Israel in their new land. A bit like the British civil law does here. And just as the British civil law doesn't apply in Japan or Norway or Mexico or Canada, the law of Moses did not apply anywhere else either. It was for the people of Israel and their brand new country only. God was in effect the theocratic king of the nation state of Israel now. At this early stage they had no human king and as head of state God was giving a written law for his people to live by in their new country just like a human king would have done. This law was signed off with a new covenant from God but unlike the eternal Abrahamic covenant this one was finite and conditional. It told the people that if they obeyed the law in their new country, they would experience a threefold blessing of prosperity, health and safety. However, if they disobeyed the law that he'd given them, they would experience a threefold curse of poverty, sickness and terror. For as long as the law of Moses existed, these promises would be in effect. Now before continuing with this series, open up the Bible at Deuteronomy 28 to read the details of this covenant. We'll be picking it up again later on. The law of Moses governed Israel's spiritual life, social life and economic life for the rest of the Old Testament period right up until the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you read the words the law in the Bible or hear a Christian talking about the law, this is almost always what's being referred to, the law of Moses.